Okay, our next speaker is Mike Vlock, who is professor of systematic theology at the Master's Seminary in, on the left coast out in California. And uh, that's seminary John MacArthur started years ago. And Mike's a graduate from the seminary as well as from uh, Southeastern Seminary. And he has uh, done a lot with replacement theology. And the first time I ever met him was in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was doing an internship. And we went out to eat one night. And he talked a lot about the kingdom. He was wanting to know if I believe there was a spiritual form of the kingdom and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I basically agree with his view of the kingdom. And I'm glad to see, like Andy Woods has a book on the kingdom that you know, says the kingdom's totally future. This is not a form of the kingdom. This is the church age. And his book is very good as well. And so it's good to see some of our people writing about this topic. And so the more the merrier, actually. So uh, he's going to do an overview of the biblical teaching of the kingdom of God, a rationale for premillennialism and why premillennialism must be true. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Remember that meeting in uh, Lincoln? Remember that was the first time I ever heard of preterism. Remember when we were at that dinner, you were starting to bring up these ideas, and I was like, I never heard of that before. So that was the first discussion I ever had on preterism was at that, that meal. So again, thank you, Tommy, for that introduction. <clears throat> As Tommy mentioned, I am from the Los Angeles area. Actually, I'm from Santa Clarita. If you were to notice on the news today, Santa Clarita, if you live in Santa Clarita, you probably think it's the tribulation period today. I've been on the phone with my wife, and there's literally like three fires in the area. And so, so far there hasn't been an evacuation, but some of the people we know have been evacuating, so that's quite a deal. So it feels a little bit like the tribulation period <laughs> over there. So anyways, uh, Tommy said, I've, uh, uh, one of the, uh, my areas of uh, interest is the issue of the kingdom of God. And so he asked me to do an overview on the biblical teaching of, of the kingdom of God, and I want to do... Uh, particularly deal with the issue of premillennialism. As you can see from my title here, I want to do a rationale for premillennialism and why premillennialism must be true. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as we talk about having a Christian worldview, it was, it was noted earlier this morning that oftentimes people who are talking about worldview, they don't talk about how the story ends. They don't like to talk about eschatology. Um, you know, when you look at the parts of the to traditional Christian storyline, creation, fall, redemption in Christ, and then we have the restoration of all things. It seems like a lot of times Christians want to talk about parts two and three. They want to talk about the fall. They want to talk about individual salvation, but there's oftentimes not enough attention given to the end of the story. But we need, we need to, to know the end of the story. That's important for our own lives. That's important for us as we uh, share the gospel and the Christian worldview with other people. So. I think premillennialism is important. There's a lot of people today that think, ah, you know, there's all these different views of the millennium. It's not that important. You've probably heard of the pan-millennialist who say, I just think it's all going to pan out in the end sort of view. I actually think premillennialism is actually very important to the Bible storyline. It's something that I like to uh, teach uh, often uh, with my students at the seminary that I teach at. I think it's a key part of the, uh, the storyline. I do think premillennialism is a very positive doctrine in the sense that, you know, you can spend hours and hours and hours talking about it without even bringing up the other millennial positions. Some of you may know that there's other views, such as amillennialism and postmillennialism, which tend to see the millennium as occurring between the two comings of Christ, and therefore the coming of Christ actually brings an end to the millennium. What we're arguing for with premillennialism is that from our standpoint in history that there's a future earthly kingdom to come. So it is future from our standpoint, it is earthly. When we talk about earthly, we're not denying that there's spiritual aspects to that. Obviously our spiritual relationship with you know, the Father and with Jesus is, you know, is central to all that. But we're affirming that there is a future aspect to it, that there is an, an earthly aspect to, to it. Uh, most of you know that when you're you know, dealing with the millennium issue, most of the discussion usually goes to Revelation chapter 20, because that's where you find you know, six references to a, to a thousand years. So most discussions of the millennium usually focus on that. I think my, my paper and presentation is going to be a little bit different in that 
I'm going to be talking about premillennialism, but actually spend very little time in Revelation chapter 20. Not that that's not important, but I, one of the ways I want to make a contribution is to show that there's actually a, a lot of evidence from both Testaments concerning what we understand to be premillennialism. Pre, premillennialism is not just a one-text doctrine. Sometimes critics want to say, well, you know, if you didn't have Revelation 20, you wouldn't have any passages. And usually I like to say to that, well, at least we have one passage, right? You don't have any sort of thing. But actually, we have way more than one. As, I, as I'm going to argue, I think, I, I think there's implications concerning the millennium, actually even going back to Genesis chapter 1, which I'll argue uh, for shortly. So Revelation 20 is obviously important. I think what Revelation 20 makes a significant contribution is it actually tells us how long the earthly kingdom of the Messiah will be before the final eternal state, which is described in Revelation uh, 21 and 22. So just know that, that I'm going to be focusing on biblical evidence outside of Revelation 20. Also something that I want to do, too, is I want to uh, address the issue of a rationale for premillennialism. Um, one of the things that I like to do, and, I like, and as I'm teaching, I like to do is, if, if it's possible, not only to say that, you know, it, be able to explain that a particular doctrine is true, but to also be able to show why it's true. And so, now maybe you can't do that with every single doctrine, and obviously if God explains in his word a certain doctrine is true, that should be good enough. But if we can also know why a particular doctrine is true, and I even like to say how this doctrine fits in the Bible's storyline. Again, by story, I don't mean fiction, but how it fits in the Bible's narrative since Christianity is dealing with history. I think the more that we can understand how the millennium fits in the Bible's storyline, I think the more effective we're going to be in sharing uh, these truths with other people. As a matter of fact, I think the more people start to understand how premillennialism fits in the Bible storyline, when they start to consider other alternative millennial views, I think it'll be clear how, this, how it doesn't make sense, how it, it doesn't fit the storyline beginning uh, in Genesis chapter 1. So, now what I'm going to be doing up here is I'm mostly be going for my paper. Uh, most of my presentation will, will not be on the screen here, although I have a few charts. So, for those who do have computers and uh, internet access and all that, just be aware that um, I'm going to be uh, mostly going from my paper, and it won't, most of it won't be on the screen. But I, did, I do have some things I, I can share with you up on the screen here, is uh, that uh, I believe the case for premillennialism involves, I think you could put it in perhaps five uh, propositional uh, statements here. One of them is going to be Revelation chapter 20, which is the last one here. But like when, when I think about the case for premillennialism or why... I'm a premillennialist. I, I, I think of these five categories, and when I'm done mentioning these here, I'll, I'll turn to a pyramid chart that I have where I, I, I list these again. But I link premillennialism with the kingdom mandate of Genesis chapter 1, particularly verses 26 and 28. I link premillennialism with Old Testament passages that predict a coming earthly kingdom under the presence of the Messiah. Number three, Old Testament passages that predict an intermediate kingdom with conditions, this is important, better than the present age that we live in, but not perfect like the eternal state that is, that is described in Revelation uh, chapters 21 and 22. So notice my first three here actually are dealing with Old Testament passages. The fourth one will be New Testament predictions of a future earthly kingdom, which will, so, will, which will show continuity with the storyline begun in the Old Testament. And then number five, an earthly intermediate kingdom of a thousand years found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And as I said before, I'm not addressing that very specifically in this particular paper. In my book, He Will Reign Forever, I have a lot more information on how the millennium of Revelation 20 is following the second coming of Revelation 19, yet comes before the eternal state of Revelation 21. Now, to put this into another format, I know this may be a little bit hard to read if you uh, aren't too close up here. But I have a uh, kind of a foundation and structure of premillennials. And basically, I just took those categories that I gave and just put them up where I have the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 28 as being the foundation for premillennialism because you're dealing with, with uh, God expecting man to have a successful earthly kingdom reign. And then moving up, Old Testament passages that predict a coming earthly kingdom, Next, Old Testament passages that predict an intermediate kingdom with conditions different from the present age and the eternal state. 
and the New Testament predictions of a future kingdom. And then at the very top uh, of that, Revelation 20, which tells us that the earthly kingdom of the Messiah is going to be uh, a thousand years. Part of the reason that I did this like this is because when you deal with people, critics of premillennialism, who are many, who say, you know, who oftentimes they want to flip, flip a pyramid around and in a sense put Revelation 20 at the bottom. In other words, you have Revelation 20 at the bottom of the, of the turned down pyramid and then premillennialism would be the rest of the pyramid. Supposedly, if that's the case, if you were to remove Revelation 20, then you would you know, supposedly remove the biblical case for premillennialism. But I'm arguing on the other side that Revelation 20 is like a culminating passage. Uh, we need that passage to know exactly how long this kingdom is going to be. But hypothetically, it's hard to play hypothetical games, but hypothetically, you know, without Revelation 20, we still understand from the rest of the scripture that there's going to be a future earthly kingdom of the Messiah when the Messiah is present from and over the earth. Those are really the key ingredients of what we're talking about here with premillennialism. A future earthly kingdom with the presence of the Messiah from and over the earth as he reigns and he shares that reign with others. And of course from Revelation 20, we know that that period is going to be uh, a, thousand, a thousand years. That's how long it's going to be. So I'll go ahead and leave this up here. Um, you know, as I move along, um, you know, as I mentioned, the uh, kingdom mandate is the foundational a part here of, uh, and also I have in the, in, in the pyramid here, it's kind of the, the, the first step here. And you may say, well, why, why, why are we going to Genesis chapter 1 when it's Revelation 20 that discusses the millennium? And let's, let's just look, let's look at Genesis 1, 26 and 28, and I think you'll see why. Obviously in Genesis 1, you have, you know, you have the, the creation days and then man is, is you know, is the, uh, you know, comes as, as the high point of the, of the sixth day of creation. But what we're told in Genesis 1, 26, to 28, I guess I could probably read this here, so I, have, I can get this up on the screen, that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So it's interesting, man is made in the image of God. He's also made in the likeness of God. Uh, I think image has representation connotations, and I think this is part of where we get the issue of a, what's called a mediatorial kingdom on earth, where obviously God is greater than all and he's the creator of the universe but he's creating man he created man in his image to represent him on this earth and notice what man is commanded to do the language here is very important man and this is what this is what god says let them rule notice that word rule let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and then you have the statement in verse 27 about him making you know, man male and female. But then moving on, God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So I think you see several important things here. Not only is man made in the image of God to represent God on the earth, but Adam, Adam is called Adam, and you have Adama, which stands for the ground in this particular passage. So I think it's interesting that Adam is formed from the dust of the ground, and there's even a close connection between his name and, what, and the Hebrew word for the ground. So that shows a close connection there. Also, notice that God told man to rule over the creation. I think that's very important because the word for rule is radah in the Hebrew. And that means to have dominion, it means to rule, it means to dominate. Also the word um, subdue is kabash in the Hebrew, and that, that's also a strong word, which means to dominate or to bring into bondage, and it means to forcefully make to confirm. I should have also mentioned too that when we were dealing with the rule word, that radad term is actually used in Psalm 110.2 of the Messiah's reign, where the Lord is, the Yahweh is gonna stretch forth the Messiah's uh, scepter from Zion and say, rule in the midst of your enemies. So that's very kingly language. Uh, that, the kabash term from which we get subdue, it's also used of the work of a king in 2 Samuel 8, uh, in 2 Samuel 8, 11. So when you put that together, all these things that we're seeing, we're seeing that there's a close relationship between Adam, who's the first man, and then the, re and then the rest of the earth. He's, he's, he's created with the physical component as, as an image bearer, there's a physical component to Adam. We see that he is to rule and to subdue. There's a close connection between him and the ground. 
I like to say that when God created Adam, he just didn't put him in church all day, nor did he tell him, okay, now I'm going to whisk you up to heaven because this is your ultimate destiny. No, he has, he has what uh, Middleton has referred to as an earthly vocation uh, that he needs to carry out. And I think some, some of these issues were brought up earlier, and rightfully so, I think by uh, Wayne House and others where they talk about uh, the fact that we, you know, we don't hold, we hold to a biblical worldview. We don't hold to Platonism. Platonism believes that there's this big gap between the material realm and the spiritual realm, and that the, the goal of the human person is to escape all physicality and the earth and the body and all those sorts of things. We, uh, we don't hold to that. We see even in Genesis 1, there's a close connection between man and the earth. Um, I think another verse that is important is uh, Psalm 115.16 where the psalmist says, the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the human race. So pretty significant there. The, the earth has been given to the human race. So that separates biblical Christianity from a lot of religions. If you study different religions and philosophies, you know, the philosophy of Platonism believed that the spiritual, you know, that the ultimate ideal was to escape anything physical. If you look at the Eastern world religions, if you look at Hinduism and Buddhism, basically those religions view the material realm as an illusion and something that we need to escape from. But biblical Christianity is saying, no, the earth matters. God made man as a physical being. He wants him to, to rule the earth and to subdue the earth uh, on his behalf. There's another passage that I think is, is important because I'm still on this first point talking about this kingdom mandate that is given to uh, Adam in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And that is Psalm 8. Now, when you get to Psalm 8, you're obviously dealing with many years later. Obviously, the fall has taken place. And when you look at Psalm 8, the very beginning verse and the very end verse um, talk about how great God is. So even though there's going to be this statement, which seems to be an elevated view of man, it's still within the context of the greatness of God. But notice what you have here in Psalm 8, verses 4 to 8. Uh, we're told, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God. And then notice, you crown him with glory and majesty. That's kingly language there. Notice also this, um, some like Eugene Merrill have pointed out, this appears to be almost like a commentary on Genesis 1, 26 and 28. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. So that's very interesting here. So we're still seeing that man still has this earthly vocation. Uh, it hasn't been lost because of the fall. I remember, you know, I, I, come, I come from a background that, was, that had a very, very spiritualized view of eschatology. And I just remember as I started thinking through things when I was in my teens that, well, you know, yeah, I mean, God created Adam and he created him on the earth. But it has to be that after the fall that the goal of man is just to live in heaven forever in, in a very uh, immaterial sort of existence. But that's not what we're seeing in the Bible. Even after the fall, there's this affirmation that man is to have a successful rule over the earth. Now, when you get to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, the writer of Hebrews is going to quote this passage, but then he's going to add this one caveat that we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So, Psalm 8 is going to be quoted multiple times in the New Testament. And I think it's significant that the writer of Hebrews, he's going to affirm the truth of Psalm 8, which affirms the truth of Genesis 1. But he will add that we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So even in the book of Hebrews, there's eschatology. We're still looking for that city to come and you know, what, is, what is still needs to happen in the future. But I think Psalm 8 is very significant because we're seeing what was supposed to be true in Genesis 1, 26 to 28 is still expected to be true. Now, of course, we know that the fall occurred in Genesis 3. Uh, death would now ensue. The very ground that man was supposed to rule over will now swallow him up in death. Uh, we also know that with the ground being cursed, uh, that man, even with you know, all the technology we, technology we see even of recent centuries and decades, that he still can't get his arms around nature. There's still a sense in which nature and creation still frustrate him. And so when we see that frustration, again, that should just draw our hearts even more to you know, crying out for our Lord to return and to you know, set up his, his kingdom uh, someday. So I think it's important to understand here that there is a 
a kingdom mandate. It's, it, it's related to Genesis 1. It's related uh, to Psalm 8. Like I said, this Psalm 8 will be quoted in Hebrews 2, will be quoted in Ephesians 1.22, will be quoted in 1 Corinthians, I think around verses 15 to 27. So there's great interest of the New Testament writers in Psalm 8, which obviously is invested in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1 uh, as well. So now I have here, as I move on down a little bit more, I, I kind of have this little kingdom connection chart here where I showed, I didn't get it all in one page, but I, I call this mediatorial kingdom connections where, let me see here if I can even get this just a little bit, a little bit bigger here. Where, where it, you notice I have Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where you have unfallen creation, man tasked to rule from and over the earth. And by the way, those prepositions are very important here. When we talk about ruling from and over the earth, that's going to be one of the things that separates premillennialism from other millennial views, because we're going to claim that when the Messiah fulfills the kingdom mandate in the millennium, that he's going to be reigning from and over the earth. Uh, the other millennial views, like amillennialism and postmillennialism, they want to spiritualize the throne of David, place it in heaven, and have the reign of the Messiah, his millennial kingdom, taking place today, even though there's no nations that recognize it, and there's a lot of rebellion that takes place. Then I mentioned Psalm 8, where even in a fallen world, explaining Genesis 1, 26 to 28, that even in a fallen world, man still possesses the right uh, to rule the earth. And then you come down even from that as this continues. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 will tell us that man still possesses the right to rule the earth, but that is not occurring in this age, which again anticipates eschatology in the future. Ephesians 1.22, I think, indicates that with his ascension, that Jesus possesses the right to rule the earth. So we see that he is exalted as Messiah, even though that reign will take place at the time of his second coming. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, which also quotes Psalm 8, 6, uh, we see that Jesus is linked with the Psalm 8 prophecy. Uh, in, in other words, you know, one of the questions that comes into play is, well, when you read Psalm 8 and its quotations in, um, in the New Testament, does that refer to mankind as a whole, or does it refer to Jesus? And I think context will determine which is true, but there's a sense in which it's both, because Jesus is going to be the ultimate man, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 will refer to him as the last Adam. So really when it comes down to it, Jesus is going to be the one that makes this happen, that makes this successful kingdom reign. And then those who are in union with him, in union with Jesus, they will also participate in that reign. We'll talk a little bit more about that lately, even though that does lead to the next point here. And now when it comes to these next set of passages, we're going to look more at these later. But in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 and Revelation chapter 5, we see that Jesus is going to share his reign um, with those who identify with him you know, in the coming millennial kingdom. Even when you get to the eternal state, the very, very uh, last verse discussing the new earth and the new Jerusalem is Revelation 22, verse 5. The rest after that is the epilogue. But in Revelation 22, verse 5, the very last statement is they will reign forever. So the very last statement about what the saints are doing indicates that they're reigning. That occurs even into the eternal state. So now I wanted to mention here, which would be, you know, if you went back to that pyramid, this would be kind of the second level of the pyramid. The first level was the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, which is affirmed in Psalm 8, which is affirmed in many New Testament passages. But there are predictions of a future earthly kingdom in the Old Testament prophets. And I'm going to be very brief here. But if you were to look at these passages and look at them in their context, you would see there's all kinds of passages that talk about a literal, tangible, earthly kingdom where the Messiah is present. You know, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, talks about there's going to be this time where the word of the Lord goes forth from Jerusalem. And it's going to be a time of international peace, where the nations of the world are going to seek the God of Israel in Jerusalem. They're actually going to lay down their weapons of warfare. Uh, the Lord's going to make executive decisions on behalf of the nations. And it's a time of global international harmony. Many have tried to spiritualize that and say, well, that's just taking place in the church today. You see a lot of people be saved. But if you were to look at that passage, it's actually talking about peace among the nations, so much so that they lay their weapons of warfare down. You can't spiritualize that to this age. 
Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7 revealed that a child and a son, who we now know as Jesus, will be born, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So that talks about a reign, a coming reign of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 11, which is a great chapter, talks about a righteous descendant of Jesse who will, quote, decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. If you were to read verses 6 to 9 of Isaiah 11, it actually talks about harmony between animals and harmony between animals and humans. And that represents a restored creation, sort of thing that Paul will talk about in uh, Romans 8, 19 to 23, when he talks about the fact that creation is groaning to be glorified when believers are glorified. If you were to look at Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25, it predicts a time, a future time, when houses will be built and agriculture will blossom and those who labor well will reap the benefits of their hard work. Verse 25 also talks about the fact that, again, that there will be harmony in creation among the animal kingdom. With Psalm 2, we have the prediction of, of, of the Messiah who one day is going to rule the nations. The nations that now scorn him and scorn God, are, God says that he's going to establish his king in Jerusalem upon Mount Zion, and he's going to reign over the nations. You look at Psalm 72, which predicts a time when a righteous Davidic king uh, will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Very tangible sort of uh, descriptions there. Also, all nations will serve him. This king will deliver the needy and the afflicted. He will also have compassion on the poor and the needy. During this time, there will also be, quote, abundance of grain in the earth on top of the mountains. So it's interesting how many of these passages, they, they talk about the necessity of the importance of faith in God, you know, and faith in the Messiah, but it also talks about, you know, these uh, prosperous conditions that will take place during the kingdom. Again, I don't believe that these can be spiritualized. They, they appear to be something that need to be taken literally. Same with Daniel chapter 2, where you have the stone cut without hands that comes that smashes the foot of the statue, which is representing those Gentile empires that are ruling Israel in this times uh, of the Gentiles. And where these earthly empires uh, reigned, the kingdom of God is going to become a mountain, and it's going to become a kingdom, and it's going to exist in the realm where those Gentile nations used to exist. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, which we'll mention more later, also tells of a time when the Lord will return to the Mount of Olives in chapter 14, verse 9, says that, and he will be king over all the earth. And then it describes what that will mean for the nations. So if you're using a good historical grammatical hermeneutic, a literal hermeneutic, you see that all these passages talking about a literal, tangible, earthly kingdom under the presence of the Messiah with conditions that we've never seen yet, those are all still future from our standpoint. So those are the first two phases of that pyramid. So you have the, remember, you have the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, 26 and 28. And then you have all these other Old Testament predictions about a future earthly tangible kingdom. And then the third level on the pyramid uh, is dealing here with the issue of intermediate kingdom conditions that are predicted in the Old Testament. And this is an argument that oftentimes hasn't been thought through enough, but I think it's, it's actually... Uh, very important. And I actually wanted to give you a quotation here from um, a person who's usually not with us on a lot of eschatology issues, but he is right on this particular issue. Um, Wayne Grudem made this point in his systematic theology, and I think on this point he's right. He says, he says, several Old Testament passages seem to fit neither in the present age nor in the eternal state. These passages indicate some future stage in the history of redemption which is far greater than the present church age, but which still does not see the removal of all sin and rebellion and death from the earth. And I think that's a great point. In other words, there are certain passages in the Old Testament that if you take a historical grammatical hermeneutic to it and you take it seriously, seems to describe conditions that don't fit the, this present age that we're in, where we still struggle with a lot of negative things associated with the curse, but they also appear to describe conditions that you can't say are the eternal state of Revelation 21 and 22. Now, what would be one example of that? One example of that would be Isaiah 65, 20. 
Now, this is in that great section of Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, which I mentioned earlier. But verse 20 says, No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, and a sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So this is actually talking about infants, and it's talking about older people. Notice in regard to these infants that no more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days. There's no infant mortality. There's, there's no babies dying from abortion. There's, no, there's, no, there's none of these sorts of things that seem to characterize a fallen world that we're in. Well, oftentimes, children don't make it into, you know, into adulthood. So there's this period where have infants that they're, 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 they're going to make it. They're, they're going to live to adulthood. Now you ask yourselves, is that true of this present age? Clearly it's not, because there's a lot of infants that, that sadly don't make it to adulthood. On the other side, we usually don't take it that there's procreation in the eternal state. Seems to indicate that perhaps this is another era, which perhaps would best fit in the millennium. But I also want you to focus on this issue where that if somebody dies at the age of 100, they shall be thought accursed. Again, that's really interesting there, because you, you think about it, you know, in Psalm 90, I understand there was longer life, you know, before the flood and, and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, Psalm 90 tells us that man has 70 years to live and if due to strength 80. And, of course, we know that there are people who live longer than that. But when people live to 100 today we, and then they die, we usually don't say, wow, what happened to him? He must have really did something wrong. You know, we usually throw a party. You know, that's a huge thing to make it to age 100. That's a really big deal in the age we live in. Now, if you think of the eternal state, though, I mean, there's no death at all in the eternal state of Revelation 21 and 22. So where, where, when is this era where somebody, they can live to 100, but if they did something wrong and it perhaps cost them their life, that you know, they would be considered a curse? What, what, what sort of era would that seem to fit? That would seem to fit Messiah's millennial kingdom, the millennium of Revelation chapter 20. We're told in Revelation 19, 15, when Jesus comes, he comes to rule with a rod of iron. And so that seems to describe conditions which are different from the present age, but also different from the eternal state. I'm going to, uh, and, and actually I have a little chart here if you wanted to see how this is mapped out. Uh, again, this is based on Isaiah 65, 20. In the present age, lifespans of 70 to 80 years. Again, we understand some live longer than that. Millennial kingdom, though, lifespans well beyond 70 to 80 years, but death still occurs. And then eternal state, people live forever with no presence of sin, death, or curse. Another example, I, I, I have some on Zechariah chapter 8, but for time's sake, I'm going to go to Zechariah 14. I wish we had more time to discuss Zechariah 14. I, I remember uh, listening um, at a theological meeting where there was this friendly debate between an amillennialist and a premillennialist, and the amillennialist said, I'm going to give you premillennialist a, a, a little bit of help on this. He goes, when you guys are debating people who are not premillennial, you should emphasize Zechariah 14 more because it is a very difficult passage <laughs> for us to deal with. In Zechariah chapter 14, if you read the first few verses, it talks about a siege of Jerusalem that takes place. The nations have come against Jerusalem to destroy it, and it looks like they're going to be successful. Then we're told that the Lord is going to return to the Mount of Olives. So the Lord comes to defend Jerusalem and he comes to the Mount of Olives, which clearly has to be a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ, from what we know from later Revelation. We're also told in verse 9, which is very important, Zechariah 14, 9 says that in that day, the Lord, he will be king over all the earth. So there's tribulation, there's a return of the Lord, and then he's said to be king over all the earth, and in such a way that there's no other name. In other words, in that day, his name is the only name. In other words, there are no other religions, there's no atheists, because it'd be stupid to be that, because you've got the Lord on earth, the Lord God on earth in the Messiah at that particular, on that particular time. So the Lord is reigning over the earth, and then we have these very interesting conditions described in Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 19. We're told that at this time when the Lord is king over all the earth, that it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, it's very interesting there, because we're going to see nations as national entities going to serve the Lord. Again, that doesn't seem to be like what's going on today, right? I mean, there, you could take a map, pick any country you want. There's no country that is a corporate entity is serving God 
in a true way. You may have certain believers, and sometimes more believers in a certain country than others, but there's no nation as a capital, uh, as a corporate entity that's serving the Lord as they should. But, but now notice this. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So there's consequences. If a nation were to disobey, there would be no rain on them. And then you get the example of Egypt. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Again, put your logic hat on and think about this. Are these descriptions being fulfilled today? I'd say absolutely not. We don't have the Lord reigning over the earth at this particular time. We're not seeing nations as corporate entities as a whole making pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And if some nation like Egypt doesn't do what they're supposed to, that there's, there's negative consequences for them. We don't see that taking place in this age. Well, what about the eternal state? Well, if you look at Revelation 21, uh, verses 24 and 26, then around to Revelation chapter 22, verses 2 to 3, the nations are brought up several times on the new heaven and the new earth, but it's all positive. The nations are bringing their glory into the new Jerusalem, and they're serving and worshiping together. So it's a beautiful picture of the nations described in Revelation 21 and 22. So this doesn't seem to describe the eternal state either. So again, I would just ask, you know, what, where does this best fit? And I would submit that a millennium. That the millennium that is described in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, that thousand-year reign of Christ, best fits this picture. It's way better than conditions we see in this present age, but not yet quite perfect like what will be true uh, in the future uh, eternal state. So I think passages like Isaiah 65, 20, Zechariah 14, again, here would be a little depiction of the, uh, a chart of the Zechariah 14, that in the present age, Jesus is in heaven and the nations do not yet submit to Jesus as king. In the millennial kingdom, Jesus rules the nations on earth and punishes those nations that do not act as they should. But in the eternal state, the nations act exactly as they should with no need of punishment. So I would agree with, uh, even though I would disagree with Wayne Grudem on a lot of things in regard to eschatology, I think he, he makes a good uh, point there that there are uh, conditions that are neither true of this age or the future eternal state. Now I want to move to the New Testament. So. Remember that the, these ideas of a future earthly kingdom where the Messiah rules from and over the earth is very explicit in the Old Testament. There's a mountain of evidence as we go to the New Testament. Now, some people want to say, well, when you get to the New Testament, it's almost like you hit a reset button. We're going to use the new to reinterpret the old, and we're going to see um, reinterpretation and redefining and transcending and transposing. Whenever I read a lot of non-dispensational biblical theologies, they like to use those words. Redefine, reinterpret, transpose, transcend. I don't see that. I, I see the New Testament continuing the storyline that was begun in the Old Testament. Yes, I understand there's going to be two comings of the Messiah, which means not everything is going to be fulfilled with the first coming. Some things will be. Other things, like the, the salvation and restoration of Israel, the land promises, all that sort of stuff need to you know, seem to fit best with the second coming of Christ. But it's also true that the New Testament also has predictions concerning a future earthly kingdom also involving Israel. I didn't include Matthew 5.5 5 on here, but I think I should have, because in Matthew 5.5 5, we're told that what the meek or the humble, what will they inherit? They will inherit the earth. Or that could be translated land. They will inherit the earth. They will inherit land. I mean, that's an eschatological promise that believers who are sons of the kingdom are going to inherit the earth. They're going to inherit land. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. I think this passage is very important. Remember, Revelation 4 and 5 is a heavenly throne room scene. But even the heavenly scenes in the book of Revelation end up having earth as a focus. In Revelation 4, you have the, what appears to be God the Father highly exalted on his throne. And he has this uh, book or scroll in his right hand. And when you get to Revelation 5, it doesn't appear that anybody's worthy to take that book, which appears to be linked to the title deed to the earth and the judgments that are needed to take back planet earth. But finally, there's the lamb who is Jesus. And he's the one who is worthy because of the cross, which is discussed in Revelation 5.9. He's the one that's able to come take the seal from the hand of God the Father. And we're told in Revelation 5.9 that this lamb has purchased with his blood people from 
every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then you have this great statement where we're told in Revelation 5.10 that, you know, in reference to Jesus, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. A lot of people say, where do you see earthly kingdom with the millennium in Revelation 20? Revelation 20 is really the fulfillment of Revelation 5.10, that there's coming a day when the saints are going to reign upon the earth. So I think there's several things we can get from this particular verse. First of all, when these saints reign, it's because of their being in union with Jesus. I mean, he's the one who has purchased them with his blood. So these aren't people who are reigning apart from Christ. They're, they're in union with him. They, they have expressed faith in him. Secondly, Revelation 5.10 indicates that this reign is future. They will reign. Remember, Revelation is being written around 90, you know, A.D. 95. And we're seeing that even as this is, truth is being indicated at this point, it's not the case that the saints are currently reigning. But notice, they will reign. And then thirdly, we see the realm of this coming reign, that it's upon the earth. Uh, it's, it's upon the earth. So I take it when Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 comes along, it says, I saw thrones and they sat on them, and I, I saw the martyrs that were killed because of their testimony. And it, it's told at the, at the end of Revelation 20, verse 4, that they had an azazon. They, they came to life and reigned with him for a thousand years. That same came to life term is found in Revelation 2.8 in reference to Jesus' physical resurrection. So I think that's very important is that Revelation 5.10 indicates that there is going to be a coming reign upon the earth that is explicitly taught. I mentioned on the next page here that there's other passages which also talk about the future role of the Messiah in the saints. Now again, I want to remind you, and I, like I said, our focus here is on a positive presentation of premillennialism. But if I could just digress a little bit. Remember with amillennialism and postmillennialism, you're having the millennium taking place in this age. And particularly if you're an amillennial, you have a spiritual kingdom. So you have Jesus reigning from heaven, even though the people on earth as a whole don't acknowledge it. But anyway, so you have this kingdom, it's now, and it's spiritual, and the second coming of Jesus brings an end to it, and you just go right into the eternal state. But look at these depictions that are given to the church. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul says to the Corinthians, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6, 3, do you not know that we will judge angels? 2 Timothy 2, 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. So if we endure, we will reign. That seems to be fleshed out in the churches of Revelation 2 and 3, where those churches, they're not pictured as reigning in the kingdom at that point. They're pictured as, as called to persevere and to endure and to overcome. Because when Christ comes again, he's going to do what Revelation 2, 26 to 27 talks about, where he says, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. What's interesting about the Revelation 2, 26 to 27 quote, is Jesus takes the words of Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm that tells of the Messiah's coming rod of iron reign over the nations, and now Jesus is saying, I'm going to share that with those who are in union with me. In this particular case, it's a message to the church, to the churches, that when he comes to rule with the rod of iron, those who are in him, and in this particular case, it's the church, they're also going to be involved with that reign. Revelation 12, 5, it talks about that, you know, she gave birth to a son, a male child. You know, I know some debate on this, but probably a reference to the Messiah, who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. Again, it's future. Revelation 19.15. Now, I think Revelation 19.15 is extremely significant because this is part of a section of Revelation 19.11 through the, red, do the end of the chapter, I think verse 21, which almost, almost all, not everybody, but almost all evangelicals seem to admit that that's a reference to the second coming of of Jesus at that particular point. Now it's interesting in verse 15 that we're told that from his mouth comes a sharp sword 
so that with it he may strike down the nations. And what will he do? He will rule them with a rod of iron. So Jesus is coming to rule the nations. If you were to hold to another millennial view, you would have to view the second coming of Jesus as bringing an end to his millennial reign, because then you just go right into the eternal state. But it seems here that he is coming specifically to rule with the rod of iron. We believe that in the coming earthly millennial kingdom, that that is a kingdom in which the spotlight is on Jesus, the Son of God and Messiah. When you get to 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and 28, it'll say that when he has successfully reigned over everything, he will hand the kingdom over to God the Father that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, verse 28. But the millennium, the spotlight is on the sun. That's why I like to say premillennialism is very Christocentric because as we're going to see later, there needs to be a sustained reign of Jesus the Messiah over the earth in the realm where he was rejected at his first coming. So there's all kinds of, of, of passages in the New Testament. I might just uh, quickly mention some others that I think are significant. So we're still within that section of the pyramid dealing with New Testament passages about a future earthly kingdom. And there's a couple passages that I think are very significant concerning the Davidic throne. Again, you have the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, and it seems like when you read the scripture, it seems to indicate that there's this throne of David where the Messiah is going to reign over the earth from Jerusalem. And in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, actually I forgot to give you the reference for this, but the first uh, scripture quote is Luke, I think it's Luke 1, 32 to 33. Um, the angel Gabriel tells Mary, he, in reference to Jesus, will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So that's talking about a kingdom over Israel that Jesus is going to have. Now in Matthew 25, 31, I think this is extremely significant because this, this is the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is explicitly addressing eschatology because he's been asked, in the first couple verses of you know Matthew 24, what's the sign of your coming? When's the end of the age? It's, it's, it's totally eschatological. And Jesus says something here that tells us not necessarily exactly when this is going to occur, but certain conditions in the future. He says in Matthew 25, 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. What's that glorious throne? That's the Davidic throne of Luke 1, 32 to 33. But notice here, when does Jesus sit on his kingdom Davidic throne? It's when the Son of Man comes in his glory. I understand preterists have a different answer to that sometimes, but it seems overwhelmingly obvious to me that the second coming of Jesus has not occurred yet. Jesus has not come in glory. We're looking forward to that. How about all the angels with him? I haven't seen that either. I still think that's a future event as well. So when it comes to Jesus coming in glory and all the angels with him, it's then that he will sit on his glorious throne. So what's significant about this verse is we don't even, I don't even know why we have to debate when the Davidic throne reign begins because Jesus is telling us when it begins. It's in connection with these other events that we know are future. The same with uh, Matthew 19.28. Matthew 19.28, the rich young ruler you know, loved his possessions more than he loved Christ. And then Peter's asking, you know, Lord, what, you know, what about us? And, and, and Jesus answers in Matthew 19, 28, and he says, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration. Now, this is a very important term. This is plin genesia in the Greek. It's literally like a genesis again. Most scholars acknowledge that this is a cosmic renewal. Even J.I. Packer says it denotes an eschatological restoration of all things under the Messiah for which Israel was waiting. Now, when you get to Titus chapter 3, this Pelin Genesia regeneration will be used of an individual Christian being made spiritually alive. But the context here is cosmic renewal. This is the glorification of creation of Romans 8, 19 to 23. This is the restoration of all things of Acts 3.21. So Jesus talks about the genesis again, the regeneration. So in the regeneration, again, notice what this is linked with, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. That's the Davidic throne of Luke 1, 32 to 33. And notice, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
That talks about the restoration of national Israel. That's talking about a restoration of the tribes of Israel. So let's put our logic hat on again. Um, when is Jesus going to sit on his glorious Davidic kingdom throne? Well, it's when the regeneration occurs and when the apostles are ruling over a restored national Israel. I take it that those events have not occurred yet and they still await the future. So again, this is another passage where Jesus tells us when he's going to sit on his, on his uh, Davidic throne. In this case, we also see implications for the restoration of Israel. So, uh, like I said, I think all of those things help, help us when we come to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And then we see in Revelation 19, Jesus comes again. And then we see in Revelation, you know, in, in chapter 19, he comes again. And then Revelation 20, there's this thousand-year reign where the saints reign with Christ. Now, at this point, I wanted to shift gears uh, just a little bit here, because I wanted to talk, uh, uh, in a sense, we've kind of laid out biblical evidence outside of Revelation 20 for premillennialism, but I also wanted to take um, some minutes here to discuss the issue of why premillennialism must be true. So this is why, in other words, what's the rationale for premillennialism? I think we've already seen the what. I mean, the Bible teaches there's gonna be a future earthly kingdom, Revelation 20 tells us it's gonna be a thousand years. But these are, these are some reasons that I think why there's a coming millennium, a premillennial kingdom as, as we would call it. First of all, I believe that there must be a successful reign of man and the last Adam, Jesus, from and over the realm, which is earth, where God tasks the first Adam to rule, but obviously Adam failed. So this is where I think you see an intersection between eschatology, which is last things, and protology, which is first things. It's interesting, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Jesus is referred to as the last Adam, and that section of verses 24 to 28 of that chapter discusses the fact that he has to have a Psalm 8, 6 reign, and it must be successful before uh, that kingdom is handed over uh, to God the Father. So th this is where we see some symmetry that's going on here. God expected Adam as representative of man to have a successful reign upon the earth. Adam and humanity has failed. Jesus, though, is the ultimate man. Of course, he's more than man, but he's ultimate man. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's going to have a successful reign in the realm where uh, Adam has failed. So the main point here, which I mentioned at the top of this, is that Jesus is the last Adam, is destined to rule from and over the realm where the first Adam failed. So in one sense, I do see a connection between Genesis 1, 26 and 28 and Revelation 20. This is the successful mediatorial kingdom reign of man. Well, who's the ultimate man? It's Jesus the Messiah. Those who are in union with him through faith get to participate in his reign. So man will have a successful reign that takes place. Uh, there's a, a, a theologian, um, Sung Wook Chung makes this connection between Adam and premillennial. He, he gives us in a chapter where he's defending premillennialism. And he says, therefore, by establishing the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ as the last Adam will restore and fulfill not only the spiritual priestly dimension, but also, but also the physical institutional dimension of the first Adam's kingdom. So he makes that connection well. The premillennial kingdom of Jesus fulfills what was supposed to take place successfully with Adam, but did not. He also goes on to say, this is above the box here, the first Adam's priest kingly activity, which was thwarted by the fall, will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom, and he means premillennial. Therefore, the millennial kingdom will be a restoration and fulfillment of the Edenic kingdom on the earth. And notice my box here as I try to picture this. Adam was tasked to rule from and over the earth, failure. Jesus, the last Adam, tasked to rule from and over the earth as the Messiah, success. And if you're in him, guess what? You get to be successful too. You get to have a successful reign as Revelation 5.10 promised, as Revelation 2.26 to 27 promised. I think another reason, so this, here's kind of a second reason or rationale for premillennialism, and that is this, that Jesus, I mentioned this earlier, but Jesus must have a sustained and visible reign in the realm where he was rejected. Remember in John 1, he came unto his own, but what? His own received him not. Well, this time when he comes again, and we, and we understand in the, in the plan of God that that was the successful first coming. That was the suffering servant mission that, that he 
and he purchased with his blood and all those, all those sorts of things. But it's the second coming where we're going to see a sustained reign of the Messiah in, in the realm where he was uh, rejected. I wanted to, to uh, as I come down to this paragraph here, I'm going to say that this leads to an issue that must be addressed. It is the Father's will that his Son rule the nations. We've seen that. Psalm 110, Psalm 2, other passages, Psalm 72. And that all be subjected to him. But in this present evil age, not all things are subject to Jesus. Also, the Bible tells us that Jesus will one day hand his kingdom over to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and verse 28. So this appears to be the time period. Um, this appears to be the time period of the eternal state when he hands the kingdom over. So the question is this. When does Jesus the Messiah rule in his kingdom and receive the glory and honor in this world that he richly deserves in the scripture promises and the Father wants? Is it simply at a second coming to earth? Because when, when I read a lot of amillennial literature, they'll say, well, on, on the day of the second coming, everybody's going to acknowledge it. But is that good enough? I mean, obviously the second coming is an extremely dramatic event. But is that, does that fulfill the recognition of the Messiah on behalf of the nations? Uh, Robert Sosi asks a good question in this regard. He says, to be sure the world will recognize Christ when he returns in glory, but does a short period of destruction and judgment before he turns the kingdom over to the Father for the eternal state provide an adequate explanation of the centrality of Christ and a sufficient manifestation of his glory within history? The correct answer to this question is no. Jesus' second coming with its destruction and judgments is not all there is to his manifestation. The day of his coming is a magnificent display of glory, but more is to come. As Sosi notes, quote, So far in history, the experience of Christ and his people has been one of oppression and non-recognition. If history comes to its end with the coming of Christ, there will be no significant time within history when his centrality is manifest. So where does the needed recognition come from? An intermediate or millennial kingdom before the eternal state, provide, quote, provides just such a time when Christ's glory will pervade human history and his significance will be rightly recognized, end quote. So thus, a millennial reign of Jesus after his second coming, but before the end when he hands the kingdom over to the Father, is the ideal time for the Son to be manifested in his glory to the world. Therefore, the millennial kingdom of Jesus after his return will be the time period when the Son reigns over the world, rewarding his servants and punishing his enemies. It's the time where the focus is particularly on the Son at that particular time. I like to say I'm premillennial because I have a Christocentric view of Messiah's kingdom. It's going to be a sustained, recognized reign over the earth. See, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the... Uh, the third point here. Actually, I'm going to say one more thing here. This is where you want to look at it from the other direction. Let's look at this issue from another direction. If the premillennial view is not correct and the millennium is spiritual and now, as amillennialism claims, what would this mean? Well, it would mean that there will be no significant period in history where Jesus is recognized as king by this world before the eternal state. The present age is characterized by wickedness and persecution of God's people, by the world and Satan. Also, Jesus' messianic reign would be characterized by non-recognition and continual widespread rebellion by the nations. So if you believe the millennium is today, you have to accept that. That overall, it's non-recognition and rebellion during Messiah's kingdom. In addition, while a present millennium would include personal salvation of some, it would not involve societal transformation and international harmony that the Bible predicted, like in Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. If the premillennial view is not correct, there is no significant period in history where Jesus is given the honor and the glory that he deserves. Premillennialism is Christ honoring and that it sees as necessary a sustained and recognized reign of Jesus in his glory in the realm where he was rejected. So therefore, to put it in chart form, Jesus' first coming, rejection on earth. Jesus' second coming, vindication and reign upon the earth. Now when you come to the third point, this is pretty parallel to the point that we've just looked at because when you read scripture, Daniel chapter seven, 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, other passages, there's a close connection between the reign of the saints and the reign of the Messiah. So when you answer that question, like if you say, okay, this is what I believe the reign of the Messiah is, you have to include that the reign of the saints. Like I said, you have a lot of theologians say, well, I think the millennium is today. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I'm reigning today in the kingdom. I'm related to the king, and I have great spiritual blessings. So there's wonderful things that have happened. But this seems to me to be an era, and I understand some areas of the world are more than others, but it seems to be an area of persecution and endurance, and where the Satan and the nations try to, to squeeze us to give up the faith. So there must be a vindication and reign of the saints in the realm where they were persecuted. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, you know, verses 13 to 14, you have this great heavenly scene where the, Jesus, the Son of Man, appears before God the Father. It's also Daniel 7 talks about this little horn who's an antichrist who's waging war against the saints. And we see that the situation flips. Daniel 7.21 says, I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So the saints are being persecuted. Again, I understand this is talking about uh, an antichrist sort of persecution, but there's persecution of the saints, and then the time comes where the saints took possession of the kingdom. They begin to reign in the realm where they were facing persecution. In Daniel 7, 25 to 27, we see again that this, this horn is speaking great blasphemies against the Most High and wearing down the saints of the highest one. But then later on, we see in the underlying section, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. So the saints face persecution on earth, and then that gets flipped, and they're going to be vindicated and rewarded in the realm where they were persecuted. So the major point here is that God's people are persecuted for a time, but when Messiah's kingdom comes, reward and vindication come with it, and the enemy is destroyed. In Revelation chapters 2 to 3, I'm not going to read all this here, but if you read, you know, you, you got the churches, they're facing various things, persecution from, uh, from, from Jews and from uh, Satan and all kinds of things are going on. But each of those letters ends up with an eschatological promise, the right to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God, not being hurt by the second death. And then that really important we saw when we saw in Revelation 2, 26 to 27, where Jesus will grant... Um, for, for the overcomer, right to rule the nations with him. Revelation 3.21 says, you know, Jesus, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, you know, you're going to be with me on my throne when I come again here. So the saints are going to be rewarded and reign when Jesus comes again, which is also discussed in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, what are we, to we told? And one of the things, that is, we don't have time to go there, but in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, it talks about martyrs who gave their lives for Christ, and they, they appear in heaven, which appears to be, the, their immaterial aspect appears in heaven, and they're crying out, Oh, Lord, how long and holy and true until you avenge our blood upon the earth? And they're told not that they're reigning at that time, but wait a while. In other words, wait a little while. But when you come to Revelation 20, we're told, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls, these are the people of Revelation 6, 9 to 11. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their, and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Again, they came to life, the azason term, it's used of Jesus' physical resurrection in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Usually amillennialists say, well, this first come to life has to be like salvation. It's, it's not real bodily resurrection. Even though they admit come to life in the next verse refers to physical resurrection, they have to say, well, this resurrection is a spiritual salvation. And I think that's, that's, that's not a good view. So they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So when Jesus comes to reign, he's coming to roll with a rod of iron, those who are in him are going to. Now, when you put it all together, Revelation 2 is talking about the church. Here we see that this involves you know, martyrs during this particular time period. But there's going, to be, there's going to be a reign of the saints that takes place in the future. So in the present age, with my little chart here, saints are persecuted on earth as they serve Jesus in the millennial kingdom. Saints are rewarded on earth 
for faithful service. And then this, this is the last major point of the paper, which is there needs to be a time in history where all aspects of the covenants and promises are fulfilled. So, you know, when you look at the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, the covenants of promise, you know, there's certain things that started to unfold immediately. Obviously, the promise of a great nation, obviously, is Israel, you know, comes into being and they, are, you know, they become related to the land. There, there's things that are starting to unfold. I think there's certain blessings associated with the covenants that unfold even more when Jesus comes the first time. But there's a lot of things that are still out there that still need to occur. The salvation and the restoration of all Israel still needs to occur in the future. Uh, the land boundaries of Genesis 15 concerning the land, that, that is still future. Um, Assyria and Egypt, Egypt having an altar to the Lord in the kingdom, and Assyria and Egypt getting together, according to Isaiah 19, to serve the Lord, have a highway where they can come together to serve the Lord, and all those passages that talk about blessings to the nations. I mean, those things still need to happen in the future. So, yes, there's been much that has been fulfilled, but there's also more that needs to be fulfilled. And I really believe that in the Millennial Kingdom, you're going to have all the dimensions of the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant in full operation during the Millennial Kingdom. And then when that's completed, like I said, this is a topic for another day, as 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28 indicates, when there is that successful reign of the Messiah upon the earth, there will be a transition to the eternal state. And at that particular point, there never will be um, anything uh, negative again. So again, my chart here with Jesus' first coming, many prophecies were literally fulfilled. With Jesus' second coming, prophecies not fulfilled at the first coming will be literally fulfilled. So my conclusion would be is that those who hold the premillennialism should understand that this view is explicitly taught in Scripture, and there is a strong rationale for this view. This position is not only taught in Revelation 20, it is supported by other passages and reasons. Thus, we can know both that premillennialism is true and know why it is true. Maybe just one more thing. It, you, know, you know, it's been brought up that we live in an age where there's a lot of academia that scorn a lot of the beliefs that we have concerning eschatology. And we do seem to be in an era where there's lots of books being written, particularly from an amillennial perspective, being very skeptical of premillennialism. But I think when the evidence is evaluated, that the, the case for premillennialism is very strong. That's not only explicitly taught, but it seems to fit the Bible storyline well, going even all the way back to Genesis 1. So, okay, I guess we're ready for some questions. Thank you. So, are we in the kingdom now? I, don't think, I, I think we're sons of the kingdom which is, I, I think in Matthew 13, we're seeing the depictions of this current age between the two comings of the Messiah. So we're sons of the kingdom. We're to have a kingdom ethic as described, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount and New Testament passages. But the kingdom is future from our So there, uh, is there a spiritual form of the kingdom now? I'm not a big fan of... Uh, I do believe we're spiritually related to the Messiah. Right. But classically, as a spiritual or mystery form has been described, I'm not big fans of those. I see the right. kingdom as future, and we're, we're spiritually related to the Messiah, but the kingdom reign is future. And so Matthew 13 is talking about postponement of the kingdom? I think there is a, uh, yeah. an offer of postponement scenario, particularly uh, which culminates in Matthew 11 and 12, where you have the cities of Israel, Matthew 11, 20 to 24. They don't believe. And then you have the blasphemy against the spirit where the religious leaders... As a, as a corporate entity there, attribute what he's doing to the devil when they're asked by the people who Jesus is. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that coming off the blasphemy against the spirit, against Jesus, that Jesus begins to speak in parables concerning the kingdom, giving new information to those who believe and hiding it from others. And it's interesting when you get to the very, very end of Matthew 13, it says that the householder is bringing out things both new and old. And so I think one of the new things would be the fact that there's going to be two comings of Messiah, which wasn't super explicit in the Old Testament. So he apparently hid it from amillennialists and postmillennialists as well. Yeah, there you go. That's right. The microphone. No, yeah. yeah, you said when will Satan be bound if it's not during the millennium? Is that the question? I think he will be bound during the millennium. I mean, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3 says he will be bound 
right at the time Jesus comes again. And I would even say that when Jesus did cast out demons during his earthly ministry, that those were snapshots of the eventual binding of Satan that would take place with the millennial kingdom. And plus, I would even say that in Isaiah 24, I didn't, I didn't even get into this, but I actually think Isaiah 24, verses 21 to 22, have millennial implication because it talks about at the end of the day of the Lord that there's going to be, when it comes to the kings of the earth and evil spiritual forces, that they're going to be, that they're going to be captured and thrown into prison and then after many days punished. This seems to be the scenario of Revelation 19 and 20, but definitely Satan's bound during the millennium. Michael, thank you. Excellent paper. Really enjoyed it. Following Tommy's question here, uh, if, if we're not in the kingdom yet, do we refer to Jesus as the king? Do you refer to him as the king? He's, I'm related to the Messiah. The ultimate son of David has appeared, and I have a spiritual relationship with him. I'm in union with him. I think I'm supposed to manifest what's described in the Sermon on the Mount. But I think being related, so I think we're positionally a kingdom. I think Revelation 5.10 hits it perfect. You have made them to be a kingdom. They will reign upon the earth. Right. So th there's Are we reigning? But you, but you've answered that question. We're not reigning today. Yeah. He is not the yeah. king today. I think this is the area as we're related to the Messiah. We're called to overcome and to persevere. If we endure, we will reign. So this is the time for right. perseverance and endurance, but the reigning comes in the future. Okay. To the, I'll just speak out. Two, okay, two, two spheres to the millennial kingdom: earthly sphere, heavenly sphere. The earthly sphere belongs to the right, the Old Testament resurrected Jew. This is how I've understood it. The heavenly sphere belongs to the Christian. Paul says five times in Ephesians that we are in the heavenly. So presumably, there's a, a sphere of heavenly blessings that belongs to the resurrected Christian that does not belong to the. Jew in the earthly sphere is is that a proper way to look at the millennial kingdom? Well, I would say is a, is a two tier. I, I, I think you have all believers. I, I think you have uh, saved Israel, resurrected Old Testament saints, martyred saints, and the church. I, I would say the church is going to be reigning in the kingdom based on Revelation two twenty six to twenty seven. Because when Jesus comes, we're totally going to roll with the rod of iron, and He's saying that the overcomer is going to be ruling with a rod of iron. So I would, I would take it that the church would be reigning in the millennial kingdom on earth, too. Yeah, in other words, the older, the older dispensational yeah. views tended to uh, think that the church in the millennium or in the eternal state, but here he's talking about the millennium, if they're going, for example, are they going to be in the New Jerusalem hovering above the earth and have access to reigning and ruling? I think yeah. just like the Messiah, they're going to be reigning from the earth over the earth and have victory in the realm where they were persecuted. So I would see okay. the earth for you. Yes. Yes, this was an excellent exposition. I have a question for a kingdom in the millennial reign, and could you expound upon Israel's relationship to the resurrected Christians during the millennial reign and what that looks like? So the relationship of Israel, like the saved all Israel, yes. is related to the church? Yes. So, you know, I do think because we're dealing with an intermediate kingdom that we are dealing with the situation that's where you have some who are resurrected and some who are not. So I, I think you're, I mean, I, I mean, according to Daniel 12, 1 to 2, there's going to be a resurrection from the grave, which would obviously include believing Israelites. So I think that there will be you know, some res resurrected saints, but there's also going to be the saved all Israel. They get saved during the tribulation that I think would enter, enter in mortal bodies. So there, I think there's going to be a mix. I mean, obviously, I think the church is resurrected. That takes place at the pre-trib rapture. So there's going to be a mix. I guess perhaps somewhat similar when Christ was resurrected, you know, with 40 days with disciples who weren't resurrected at that point. But I, I would see there'd be a mixture. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question directly or not, but I, I think there's going to be an inter... It's hard to know a lot of the specifics of exactly what that's going to look like. But it seems to me... Um, one of the things that separates... This age, you're having an age of where there's satanic, worldly persecution against the saints. When Jesus comes again, there's actually a righteous rule over the nations where the Messiah and those born to him are reigning. 
I think that the church is going to participate that. Obviously, I think Israel is going to see fulfillment of their land promises and geographical boundaries at that time. It's hard to know exactly what the dispersion looks like. Resurrected Gentile believers probably involved with ruling Gentile parts of the earth, probably. But it's hard to know specifics of that. Hi, Mike. Um, I apologize. I haven't had time to read your book. It's just out. I read the preface kind of things, and it made, uh, if I can remember correctly, uh, already not yet con uh, statements in the preface. Could you explain to me what you understand by the already not yet and how you apply that in your book? Yeah, I think, well, let's say the already not yet concept is often linked with certain individuals. Let me just put it this way. From a broad perspective, I think there's some validity to the concept, but the people who've been most associated with an already not yet concept, like Dodd and Ladd, I don't like their already not yet. Okay. So in other words, I mean, I think there's certain things that we've, we've seen. I mean, obviously Jesus is the ultimate David. That's related to the Davidic covenant in some way. I think that, so in one sense, you're seeing that. You're seeing Abrahamic Gentiles being related to Abraham through faith, Galatians 3. There, there's a, so in the sense, Gentiles becoming in Christ and related as a son of Abraham through faith. There's some already aspect to that in, in concerning the Abrahamic covenant. But there's still a lot of not yet of the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the new covenant still to come. So in general, I think sometimes some of, some of the spiritual blessings, I think, of the new covenant, I think we experience those things. There's a now uh -huh. um, indwelling Holy Spirit, those things. I think when it comes to the restoration, salvation of Israel and their land, physical blessings to the nations, restoration of Jerusalem. Uh, I think a lot of those physical things are still future. So there's one sense in which I think there's some validity. But when I look at how... A lot of times when people hear of already not yet, they think of C.H. Dodd and think of George Ladd. I don't like their already. I think they have way too much already. Um, I, I, and I don't think that they have a not, enough not yet. <laughs> so how much of that is your, in your hermeneutic then? How much is in the hermeneutic? Uh, yes. Because well, usually that's where the problem I get. Like I would just say, if you're applying a historical grammatical hermeneutic, you're going to see Gentiles related to Abraham according to Galatians 3. So you've got to call that our... I guess whatever historical grammatic when there, there's some sort of connection being made that you have to go with that as, as an already fulfillment. Like, I guess just to take the Davidic, is Jesus the ultimate David? Yes. Is that related to the Davidic covenant? Yes. How about the Davidic throne? Well, Jesus tells us that the assumption of the Davidic throne and the reign are future. Okay. So, For example, the progressives will say yeah. uh, they are now reigning and they will reign already, not yet. Yeah, I don't like, I mean, some of the progressives are putting Jesus on David's throne in this. Yes. I don't think that's right. Okay. I mean, I'm very big on the fact that the Davidic that the Davidic throne is future. Yeah. So if the Davidic assumption of the Davidic throne and the Davidic throne reign are future from our standpoint. There's some progressives who believe there's some already aspect. I don't agree with that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Daryl Bach, I spent hours talking to him years ago, and he could not show me a passage that taught the concept from the Bible already not yet. In other words, that's an idealistic imposition yeah. on the text and you know you have people like Maltman who says everything the whole Bible is eschatological and you have all that kind of stuff coming and it's not based on inductive study or exegesis or anything like that and wouldn't already be things like justification sanctification Christian life and those kind of things yeah, I think that would be right. Yeah, and what is future is future. Yeah, what is future is future, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in traditional systematic theology. So they're trying to create a theoretical basis for a spiritual form of the kingdom in the present, aren't they? Definitely. Definitely the claim that Acts 2 is teaching a present Davidic reign. I just right. don't see that at all. Well, I think Acts, in Acts 2, Peter's affirming that Jesus is the resurrected Messiah who will sit on David's throne. Right. But he's not saying he's on David's throne now. Yeah, he, he fulfilled all the qualifications to sit on David's throne, but it's just not yeah. yet. Because he's the Messiah, he can't stay dead. Yes. But it's, it's just being the fact that Psalm 132.11 brings up the Davidic throne doesn't mean he's reigning. It just means the Messiah, he has to be resurrected. If he's going to reign someday from it, he can't stay dead. Plus, Ma Matthew 13 clearly teaches that the kingdom is being postponed. Yeah. I think the future Davidic throne assumption and reign is just explicitly clear. 
Yeah, and they're saying that Christ is on David's throne in heaven yeah. when a spiritual dimension to it. Right? When David's throne is never talked about being in heaven, it's always on earth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, was there one over here, or is this it? Well, if that's it, then we'll see you at seven.